Thank you today for your goodness, your mercy, your grace, your kindness. Thank you for the love that you show us day by day. You're an amazing God. Uh, and you do great and wondrous things for your people. So Lord, today, as we get ourselves to you, as we say yes to you, will you wait? Show us your plan, reveal your principles, God. I will live for you with all our heart, our mind, our body, and our soul. God will serve you with everything we have inside. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 We see you with grateful God for all that was done. Uh, Super Devil has allowed us to be here today. Uh, thank you again for his continual kindness uh, and also uh, his grace uh, that he shows to us uh, daily. Uh, it's great to see you all here tonight uh, to be part of the, of the Bible study. Uh, thanking God for his uh, goodness and, and his uh, mercies, uh, which I do every morning. Uh, it's been a great day. Uh, we had a wonderful time at our noon session. We had a good time in just the previous session at 5.30. And so we're looking forward to doing that, that being the same uh, today. The kids over in the, in the other room, they're having a blast already. Uh, and so it's just, it's just good for us to be here. Those who are watching today by uh, YouTube Live, God bless you guys. Thank you for being here with us on the day. Those who are watching this today uh, by Facebook Live, God bless you guys. Thank you for hanging out with us on, on today. Uh, Sister Hawkins, uh, praise the Lord. Hey, Pam. Uh, you. Thank you guys for the hearts and, and, and the thumbs up. I just love the kind of sound, so thank you so much. We had a good time today. Um, we, we, we're embarking upon a, a, a new series, um, starting the first of the year out. I, I, I was uh, oscillating between uh, two thoughts uh, for uh, this lesson for, for to, to begin the year out. One, I thought about doing the book of Colossians. Uh, this story, we, it's been a while since we did a verse by verse, chapter by chapter uh, study. So I thought about that. And then I also thought about doing this, a, a study on uh, the lesser known uh, Bible characters. And so let, let me kind of tell you the, the epiphany of how this all, all occurs and how we started uh, this particular series. Uh, my sister, and you, many of you know, this is the time of year where uh, the movie uh, basketball season is picking up and the kids are playing and the parents are out there cheering them on and all that, all that good stuff. Well, uh, my, my nephew, Lanika's, uh, son plays uh, basketball. And she was talking about the, the, the unique thing that they have there at, in North Carolina. Uh, based off the skill sets of, of the children, uh, each child gets a, a, a band. Uh, so when they play in that particular uh, quarter, they have a band on that, that, sh that shows their, their skill set. So let's say, for instance, you go to red band, then red bands play against other kids that are red band. Uh, so that you don't have a kid who has a red band playing against a, a child who has a blue band because it's based off of skill sets. That way, it's like a, a means of motivating the kids to be able to play and not intimidated by somebody else who has a, a greater skill set because right now it's still all uh, developmental uh, for them. Uh, so she says, you know, she was, uh, she didn't know about it because her, her husband was like her son to practice and stuff. And so the, uh, she went to the first game and she saw her son playing. She was all excited and he was in, in the first group that, that went out to play. Uh, then she saw another group come out there and play, and she said that, that these kids, they weren't as great as the, the group that was before. So she's, she's chuckling because she's trying to figure out, you know, what's going on? Because it's like the, the game, you know, they had these really good kids, and now the kids are out there. They can barely drill, they can barely shoot, and she's, she's, so she's trying to figure out you know, what's going on. Her husband begins, begins to explain to her, well, here's how the league works. We have a skill set versus skill set as opposed to you know, just team versus team. And uh, so they did it really like that. And that each kid, each child has equal playing time because they practice out because the skill set versus skill set as opposed to trying to win the game per se. It's about developing. So she begins to like it more because she realizes and says that if she were out there, uh, she wouldn't be on the group that went out first. She <laughs> says that she'd be in the group that was out there in the, in the second and third uh, string because she said, I'm, I'm not that great. Uh, but, but then she said this to me. She said, but, uh, but because I'm not great doesn't mean I'm not valuable. And uh, it was in that moment, like, boom, it just kind of hits me. Like, Wait a minute, because we, we normally look at, at, at first string people, and we're thinking that uh, these are the elite people, these are the ones that are valuable. And we forget that there are some second string people and third string who may not be as good at, as others, but it doesn't mean that they're not valuable. So I kind of I said, OK, yeah, I got it. What we're going to do is we're, we're going to do this lesson on uh, lesser known uh, Bible characters. Because for us, David is like a first string person, you know, and, and, and he's uh, he's an elite. You've got 
Paul, he's an elite, and people like that. But then there, there are others who are really, who, they were game changers, but they don't have as much playing time. They don't get as much notoriety in scripture. So I want to talk about them because um, they're, they, like us, like you and I, are second and third string people. But because we, we're not the star, it doesn't mean that we're not uh, valuable. Uh, so we're going to look at, at those and see how we also, too, can be valuable. Let me explain how the lesson is going to work today. Uh, I'm going to introduce a series. Uh, so we'll have two introductions. Don't worry about that. It's just kind of the introduction for the series and then the introduction for this particular lesson. That's how it's going to work. We'll pick up a little speed uh, as we go along. Uh, so let, let's get started uh, as uh, we are, are, are ready for today's lesson. Now they're trying to bait me on a conversation between about Kobe and Shaq, and Shaq is not a third or second string player. Shaq was the main anyway. Uh, but I will not be baited by, by that conversation today. Of course, MJ uh, was a player of, of all times. Thank you. All right. Let's go. Uh, let's go. Uh, there, are, there, there are numerous uncelebrated people uh, in, in the world. There are unsung heroes and, and heroines um, who quietly change the world. They range from uh, mothers and fathers and brothers and sisters and aunts, uncles, teachers, coaches, uh, and the list, co-workers, the list just goes uh, on uh, and on. They are uncelebrated uh, game changers. Um, the, the definition of a game changer is a, is a person who's a visionary, who alters uh, either life and or also business strategies, uh, conceiving an entirely new approach as to how uh, to do something. It's a new strategy by which to uh, make culture better or and also make society uh, better. The thing to note about a game changer is that they, they change the way things are done. They change the way uh, of how we think and even they change the way how things uh, are made. The Investopedia <coughs> describes uh, a game changer as a person uh, who has new and different ideas that stand out from the crowd. Uh, that person has an idea that, that completely changes uh, the way uh, a situation develops. They, they develop uh, and, and create uh, new ideas and uh, events that actually uh, change the outcome of people's lives, making their lives uh, better. These uh, game changers impact uh, why we do what we do and how to make uh, that thing in fact better. The term game changer came about uh, in 1993. And even though the, ter the term came uh, in 1993, uh, the concept of a game changer has been around for a long time. Uh, it, it, even as, early, or as late as uh, the, the scriptures, the biblical history, there were uncelebrated people uh, who were early on, in the early age of, of man, uh, unsung heroes. They helped to change the world and even change how we uh, do things. These unsung heroes and heroines, they offer teachable moments with uh, character traits and, and their, their winning uh, personalities. The, the, the typical uh, um, game changers or uncelebrated game changers uh, show that it's possible that we too uh, can be game changers. It shows it's possible that we too uh, can uh, make life and, and things uh, uh, better. So let's look at that today. Let, let's consider the possibility uh, of being a game changer. And as we start to, to move into that, just uh, does anybody know, uh, and it doesn't have to be a, a Bible character, but just someone in your own life or someone that, that you know is an unsung hero or a, an uncelebrated uh, game changer? Anybody know one or have one in your own life? When I worked with the city, uh, um, the, the health commissioner, Peter Billingsley, okay. he, um, me and him did a thing where we did the needle exchange program, and he asked me my opinion of it, and he did a needle exchange program, which was for addicts where they could come and get fresh needles to help curb the AIDS epidemic sure. that they were suffering, and, and the program was so successful that you don't really hear about it anymore, but he was a game changer, I would say. Good. Yeah. He never got recognition for that. Oh, yeah. and, and that was what the, the, the follow-up behind that was, and how did they make life uh, better? So there are there are people out there. 
They don't have much of notoriety, but they're, they're, they're making things uh, better uh, uh, in life. And, and they, they show that we too uh, can be that kind of game changer. Please go with me to the book of Hebrews, the 11th chapter. Hebrews chapter 11 is where we want to start uh, today. This is how we'll, we'll begin our, our journey in at Hebrews, uh, the 11th chapter. Again, those of you who are watching us by uh, Facebook Live, you guys can help us out today. Uh, you'll be blessed by this lesson. Do me a favor. Uh, hit that share button so your friends and your family can be a part of this lesson. I'm telling you, it's going to bless you tremendously. Uh, we're game changers, and, and we want to find out how we, too, uh, are, are able to help change the world. So hit that share button, please. Thank you guys uh, so much. Uh, faith is an essential prerequisite in coming to God. For without faith, the Bible tells us, it's impossible to please God. That's the, uh, the 11th chapter of Hebrews, verse number 6. But before we can uh, get to the idea of what, uh, uh, how, we, how to please God, it tells us without, without faith, it's impossible to please God. Which means then, you have to, uh, to have faith in order to be able to please God. But if we don't know what faith is, then it's going to be impossible for us to do. Hebrews 11, uh, verse number 1 is what we're going to consider. Uh, faith, first and foremost, by definition, uh, is it's a persuasion. It's a, it's a moral conviction. It's a reliance upon it. It's a profession. It's a assurance. It is a belief. The etymology of the word faith uh, literally means to bind, it's a bind or to be bound to. Think of it like uh, someone who doesn't want an historic tree to be cut down. That person binds himself to that tree because that they're, they're suggesting that this tree is so valuable that they uh, would now bind themselves to it. Uh, they're tying themselves, bringing themselves power uh, to whatever it might be. Uh, you and I, when we consider faith, the idea is the same. We render ourselves powerless to whatever, we're binding ourselves to whatever we believe uh, is essential or is uh, we're convicted or persuaded uh, concerning. Hebrews 11, verse number 1 says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, come, the evidence of things not seen. Now, that's important because it does not say, now faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. It says faith is the substance of things hoped for, come, the evidence of things that's not seen. Which means then that the, the substance is evidential. And uh, if faith is substance, that same substance provides evidence, conviction, or proof. Well, well let's, let's consider that. The word, the word substance in the Greek is, is hypostasis. Um, we only point that out because of, of, of where we're about to go with it. Uh, it, it, it literally means uh, foundation of showing the title needed and a guarantee uh, of, of things. That same word appears in Hebrews chapter 1, verse number 3, when it talks about Jesus, who being the brightness of his coming, the express image of his person. The word person there is hypostasis, which is the same word for substance in, in Hebrews chapter 11, verse number 1. It's a two-part word. Uh, stasis means to it's a standing pillar upon which uh, things are, are held. Much like the pillar that we have uh, here in, in the room, uh, it is for these two pillars, the pillar of your life and three actually, <coughs> the building of the, the, the roof uh, that's above us, uh, these pillars help to support uh, the roof that, that is, is over us. Uh, so faith, the, the stasis is a pillar. Oh, how did I miss that? Two, three, four, okay. There's four. Oh, there's yeah. this addition to it. But we, we have four that are out. Wow. And, and we painted those in. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you worked hard to do it. <laughs>
to something, but I, I struggle, I'm just being very honest with you, I struggle with the idea of, of, of faith for a long time, because uh, how, how are you grasping for something that, that you're not even sure that, that exists, and then one day as I'm doing a study, and I'm, I'm, I'm going through looking up the, 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 the words and, and the root of it, and I found uh, hypostasis, and I said, wait a minute, if faith is understanding, like for me, you know, uh, in, in a logical analytical thinker, this just opened up a brand new world for me. I'm like, I'm now, I get it now. Uh, faith is, it's an understanding, understanding coming by information or by, by knowledge. Uh, so when, when, when one is exposed to information or one is exposed to knowledge, now their understanding uh, begins to grow. Consider this. Faith comes by hearing. Hearing comes by the word of God. So then, if faith comes by hearing, uh, and so the hearing is the conveyance of the word of God, hearing brings the word, uh, so that now faith can arise, or, or understanding can begin to illuminate, uh, so the more that we're exposed to information, the more that we hear, uh, the more we, are, we engage with knowledge, the more our faith is substantiated. Uh, it's really amazing. So then, uh, if, if that's the case, faith is substance or understanding, and Jesus is uh, the express image of the person of God. Jesus is the understanding of God. He's the understanding of God. Now, you see this in your heart. Uh, God is everywhere uh, present. Literally, everywhere present. There is not a space where you go that God uh, is not. He is everywhere. He fills all spaces and he fills all, all times and he has all power and all such. It is totally amazing to consider. Uh, I told the story two times already today in the other two Bibles. I'll tell you all the same story I told today. Um, I'll never forget the, the moment where my brain began to kind of conceive the idea of how powerful God is and how omnipresent he is. We were, I was in the seminary class, and my, and my professor uh, was talking that day about God's existence. And, and, the, and he dealt with that, he dealt with uh, the immensity of God, uh, showing how God is fully complete in all spaces, and then how the infinity of God, how God just keeps going, 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 and, and, and if you learn about God today, uh, he's just, uh, he's growing even more tomorrow, and, 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 and so you never, uh, there's no ending to him, it just, it just goes on, on, and on. Uh, well, I, and I, I was so blessed by that, I walk outside, get in the car, and I, I said out of my mouth, well, Lord, uh, 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 let's go home, and I, I opened the door uh, to get in, and I said, how would you meet me uh, inside? Uh, and I, I, I chuckled at the idea, like, you know, wow, God just, he just, he was outside the car with me, he walked to the car with me, he got in there, uh, I opened the door, he got in there before I did, when I didn't open the door, it was just short there, and as I'm driving along the way, just musing about the lesson uh, that day, it hit me, as God is riding with me, God is, I'm, I'm driving through God uh, at the same time, so uh, he's with me while I'm in him and going through him. Uh, simultaneously, like that, that's like, you know, uh, amazing to consider, you know, the, how massive uh, God is, how everywhere present God uh, is. But because our brains cannot conceive it, as, as David says in Psalm 139, such knowledge is too wonderful for me, it is high, I cannot attain it. Uh, what God did, he capitalized himself uh, in Jesus so that you and I might be able to understand, oh, now there's God. Uh, so Jesus is the understanding of God. Jesus is the solid reality that there is, in fact, a God. Um, so faith is understanding. That same substance or faith, uh, it, which is uh, the substance, is cross-examined. It's evidential. Same substance, evidential. Here's what you consider that. The, the chair that you're sitting on right, uh, right now uh, is substance. But that chair has been tested. Long before you ever sat on it, uh, when it came from the factory, they already knew uh, the weight capacity uh, for the chair. So when they put the product out, they knew in advance, you know, and th this is a good chair, it has been tested, it has, it has been approved. How many of you are old enough to remember when, you know, you, you had the little stickers in your clothes where it said, that inspected by, uh, you know, so-and-so, so yeah, when you nod your head like that, you smell 
had to have a law of redemption first before he worked salvation uh, in you. So he established the law so he could work out uh, the law uh, or work out the principle of salvation in us. He establishes the law of, of redemption so that now you and I might have uh, the law of redemption or, and, or bring salvation and work inside us. He knew it was substance. It had been proven long before he'd ever given it out, which means then, if God's going to work a miracle in your life, he already knows it's guaranteed. Mm. It's been cross-examined long before he ever worked it in your life. Mm. If God provides a promise for you, it has been cross-examined before it comes to you. If God provides a blessing for you, it has been cross-examined before it ever comes. It is guaranteed. I love that. The same with his word. It cannot return to him uh, uh, void. It must. Everything God does must come to pass. So faith is an actual possession of reality. It's a type of deed. We possess it now. It is not something that we have to wait on. It is a present tense reality uh, which continues on, glory to God, uh, throughout uh, time. Now, which brings me to uh, our, our, our second uh, introduction, which brings me to our character study. Please go with me to uh, the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter 5. Then we're going, to, we're going to come back to Hebrew chapter 11. Then we'll go to the book of Jude. So there's three scriptures we're going to look at. Genesis 5, uh, Hebrews 11, and then uh, the book of, of Jude. Jude only has uh, one chapter, <coughs> so we'll, we'll look at that. Right? Uh, Jude, uh, Genesis chapter 5, Hebrews 11, and then Jude. In Genesis 5, we're going to pick up at, at verse number uh, uh, 18. When in, in, in the fifth chapter of Genesis is a genealogy. It, it, it records a timeline uh, from Adam uh, actually up into Noah and, and the flood. Uh, if we sat down today and we started working out the number of years from the time uh, how Adam, from Adam's birth until we could actually go to the flood and then backtrack and figure out uh, because the, the flood, is, we know the date of the flood, we know the date of uh, for Israel going into bondage, uh, using those two points, we can actually figure out how old the earth is. We don't have time today to do that, uh, but we, we do have a, a working understanding about the, the age of the earth. And by the way, it is, in fact, a, a young earth. A young earth. Uh, and so um, keep that thought in mind as we approach the text. When, when, when uh, verse 18, when Jared had lived, 162 years, he fathered uh, Enoch. Okay, now, let me just pause to say, uh, what does a 162 year old uh, look like? You know, I'm just saying that uh, he is lived uh, 162 uh, years old. Uh, scientists have proven that the human heart uh, can live up to 500 years old. Uh, the human heart can live up to 500. That's what they've determined already. It can live up to 500, it is well taken care of, up to 500 years old. The human brain, they determined, can live up to 350 uh, years. Yes, uh, your brain still has plasticity even after 70 uh, years of, of age. And so despite what people try to say, well, I'm just getting old, I got, I got old man's brain. Well, it's probably because we, didn't, we don't eat properly, we don't do brain exercises, so then our brain starts to shut down. Just putting that out there. Uh, neurology kind of backs up my, my, my statement. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, what, what science is doing is proving that the Bible was, in fact, right the entire time. So when Jared, uh, and, and what he does well, um, what the fifth chapter of this is doing is to let us know how old someone was when they had their first son. <laughs> so Jared was 162 years old when he had uh, his first son. Uh, he blew Abraham out, out of the water. Yeah. This is a potent brother. Yeah. 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 Two years old. Hallelujah. Yeah. Right? Yes, yeah, that's what he <laughs> yes. his first His first son, his name was, was Enoch. At, Jared lived after he fathered Enoch for uh, 800 years and had others of his daughter. Thus, the, the days of Jared was 962 years and he died. Now, how old does a 962 <laughs>
nine years for my Bible trivia people. Uh, just for, you know, if you want to know, the oldest man that I was was Uzzalem. He lived 969 years. The second in running is, is uh, his grandfather, um, Jared, who lived uh, 962 years, only by seven years of the difference between uh, these two. Quite, quite remarkable. Uh, now go to Hebrews, the uh, 11th chapter. Hebrews 11. Hebrews chapter 11. Verse 5, by faith, that's a little important there, by faith, Enoch was taken up so that he should not see death, that was by faith, and um, he was not found, because God took him, or had taken him. Uh, now, before he was taken, he was commended as having pleased God, and without faith, it's impossible to please him. Uh, now, normally, we, we quote that verse without even, even pointing out verse number five. Uh, but it was because of the commendation of faith and pleasing God. Now, verse number five, verse number six comes into play. Without faith, it's impossible to please, please him. Whoever God would draw near to God must believe that he, God, exists and that he rewards those who seek him. Now, let's go to Jude, the book of Jude. Verse 14 and 15, only two verses. And it was about these that, that Enoch, the, the seventh from Adam, prophesied, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousand of his holy ones to execute judgment on all and to convict all the ungodly of their, uh, their deeds and ungod ungodliness that they have committed in such an ungodly way. And of all the harsh things that ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Now, see what just happened. Uh, all the verses that, that apply uh, to Enoch, we just read. Every verse in our Bible that refers to Enoch was just read. Now, consider something. Did you ever see Enoch talking in the Old Testament? There's no record of him talking. Yet Jude says in Jude 14 that Enoch prophesied. We got some work to do. Uh, Enoch prophesied. We have no record of his prophecy, but Jude is quoting in the New Testament of the prophecy. Uh, of Enoch. And, and Enoch, in his prophecy, especially what Jude is showing, he's uh, prophesying the coming of Jesus Christ in the earth uh, the second time to bring judgment. He, he's showing the Lord's, the second coming of God uh, in the earth. So if, he, if he's prophesying this, there's got to be some, some more that, uh, about him that we don't know that we need to uh, understand. So let's, let's have some fun today uh, and figure uh, th this out. Uh, the reward of faith is God's approval. 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 The is God's approval. Now, what is the reward of faith? God's approval. Now, I went through all that and God gave me that weak answer a little shot one more time. What is the reward of faith? God's approval. So much. Yes. The reward of faith is, in fact, it's God's uh, approval. It's being approved uh, by God. Well, uh, Hebrews 11, verse number 6 says, we just read it a moment ago, that our faith is, it, it, it is impossible. If we don't have faith, it is impossible to please God. But remember again, faith is substance. That word substance is understanding. So faith is understanding. Without having a, a working understanding, it is impossible to please God. Because uh, he that draws near to God must believe that he is, he is or that God exists. So then let's consider it. You don't go worship a God that you don't have knowledge of. You don't have a relationship with somebody you have no idea as to who they are. Right? <laughs> you shouldn't marry somebody that you don't know. <laughs> you shouldn't. <laughs> so so, so the, the, the concept behind it is now, that if you're going to draw near to God, you must have a knowledge that God, in fact, exists. So it's impossible uh, that not to have no faith and then draw near to God. Okay? Has to be an understanding. And then, whoever draws near to God uh, must know that God will reward that person who will pursue him diligently. 
understanding. If you don't get anything, he says, make sure you, whatever you get, make sure you understand. There's a whole lot of things that we did and we had no understanding. So if all you're getting was what are you going to obtain, make sure you obtain. You can pray better when you understand. You can live better with it, y'all, when you understand. When you understand money, uh, you budget better when you understand. When you understand your nutrition, then you, you eat better. But without understanding, then, you know, we're, we're going to just blindly walk through life uh, and, just, and do self-destructive things. So, so uh, the Lord says, please, well, please, because uh, they demonstrated the kind of faith that actually uh, pleased God. So God accepted their faith, he approved of them because of, of their pursuance of who uh, he was.
serving God. That is the highest thing you can ever be uh, uh, in life. I don't care what they call you. And, and, and the one thing I know for sure is that, that they can take all titles away from me, but they can never take away that I'm a servant of God. Uh, they can demote me to in an organization. They can strip me of titles. That's all fine. But the one, you, you guys can put me out as a pastor of this church and say, we don't want you to anymore. But the truth be told, you can never take away the fact that I'm a servant of God. Can never take away. And, 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 and so we have to decide with our lives, give God a, a cool, find God a, a fault. So, who's Enoch? Uh, Enoch was uh, the, the, the son of Jared. And he was the father of Methuselah. His name, Enoch, means literally means dedicated. That's what his his name means. His name means dedicated. Note that it does not mean dedicated to God. It just simply means dedicated, which tells us this: Enoch had to decide what he would be dedicated to. He had to make a decision what he would dedicate his life to. Now, if we were to walk with you, we would analyze. Your day, uh, who would analyze your, your life? What, what, what would we say that you were de- actually dedicated to? What would we say that you invested the greatest amount of, of your time in pouring? What would we say? Because wherever you spend your life, wherever you spend your time, is your, your means of dedication. And so you're not going to decide what you're dedicated to. We know this. He's the son of Jared. Uh, Jared has him when he's 160 years old. You know, uh, Literally 65, he has his son Methuselah. And in in two times, Enoch walked with God. And then again, it says Enoch walked with God. Uh, So there's something about what he does, something about his walk that caught the attention of the writer to note that two times he walked with God. He has to write it out to specify in just one verse and the verse after it that the thing that stood out the most about him is that he walked with God. There's three significant things that you want to know about Enoch. Number one, he was dedicated and committed to God. Number two, he had uh, uh, initiated a, a deeper kind of walk and a deeper kind of life with God. Number three, that Enoch actually taught by his life and taught others to have a relationship and a commitment to God as well. By his self-control and by his self-denial, uh, Enoch took the time to make sure that he walked with God. So, what does it mean to walk with God? For the, the two times, in verse 22, chapter 5, verse 24, chapter 5, only a verse is in between. Two times, the writer has to mention, it was something about his walk. Now, uh, I, I, I've lived on my dad uh, long enough that when uh, I don't have to be in the same room with him, uh, when he's walking, I know his foot pattern. I know his gap. You know, that's the way he walks. Uh, and so it's, it's immediate. My, my, my brain knows that's his. You know, because of uh, his, his foot pattern is, is distinct. So there was something about the way that Enoch walked that got the attention of, of the writer that he would have to tell us Enoch walked with God. What does that, what does that look like? The word for walk, uh, it, 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 it means to uh, move forward. The thought behind it is to go along. It is a forward movement, a steady uh, progress. Here's the thought. That Enoch was not fluctuating with God. He wasn't up and down with God. And I'll give it to you like this. The old saints, when I was growing up in church, they did talk about, you know, you can't be, you can't be sidestepping. You know, uh, I never understood what, what, what that meant. Not so I get it now. Back then I had no idea. Like, what, what do you mean sidestepping? That means you're, you were, you're supposed to be going forward. But something occurred, and you decide to you know, uh, do this over here as opposed to keep going where you're supposed to be. And then, they, 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 of course, all equally talk about the back, that backsliding. Proverbs 14, 14 tells us a backslider in his heart is filled with his own way. Meaning this, that whenever you decide to do it your way and not God's way, <coughs> God, mm-hmm. as, as a backslider in, in heart. Mm-hmm. It isn't that you committed anything. It's just that when you decide, my way. God says do this. And you say, well, well, uh, I want to do this. Well, that's how backsliding starts. It starts in the heart with whatever starts as an action. So uh, walking with God, uh, we're not stepping to the side. We're not uh, sliding backwards. We're moving forward. But we're 
progressing. And, 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 and Enoch found a rhythm. Uh, uh, Enoch found a, a pattern uh, by which uh, he can walk uh, with God and keep progressing and, and, and steady movement uh, in walking. With him. Have you found your pattern? Uh, and have you found that rhythm uh, as of yet? That, that now, uh, as you're walking with God, I found the pace. I, I found the rhythm. I'm, I'm going to keep up that pace, keep up that rhythm with God. Notice this. Uh, the scripture says, you never walk with God after he begot Methuselah. Yeah. What do you mean? That something took place in Enoch's life that made him decide, I better start walking with God. Mm-hmm. It was the birth of his son. Mm-hmm. His first son, uh, Methuselah, uh, sparked something in him that said, you know what? Um, I can't keep doing this. I've got to decide from this day forward i got to start walking with God. Have you had your life-altering moment that now stands out in your head where you just say, you know what? From now on, I've got to start walking with God. Amen. Have you had that, that moment, that, 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 that aha, that kind of shock you moment that says, you know what? I can't keep living like this. I've got to decide. I must walk with God. Mm-hmm. And for Enoch, when Methuselah was born, mm-hmm. hit something. I can't, I can't keep living the way I, I have been. Mm-hmm. I've got to decide, I'm going to make it count. I've got to make my life count. I've got to move forward and walk with God. Here's what's interesting. Uh, the, the, the name Methuselah is son. And here's how we know it, it, it was that. It, it, Methuselah's name means when he is gone, it will come. It also means when he is gone, the waters shall come forth. What do you mean by that? Think about it for you. Uh, I told you earlier that we can use the Genesis 5 to track creation, the beginning of creation, and, and find out how old the earth is. Uh, because Genesis 5 leads us from the f- backwards of the flood, uh, starts and then gives us the chance to look at the different people uh, going from Adam all the way up to the flood. But it starts from a flood sequence to take us back that way. Uh, so we know the time of the flood, we work backwards. This is what we know. That when we look from Adam and keep moving forward, that Methuselah lived 969 years, and the Methuselah died the same year that the flood occurred. Same exact year. His father names him, when he, my son, is gone, it will come. We don't know if he died days before the flood. We have no record. There's no record that shows he died in the flood. But we do know this at least. His name says, when he is out the way, when he is gone, now the waters shall come forth. So just based off the translation of his name, it suggests then that he was the king to the coming flood that, that when he was moved out the way, that now the waters of the flood could now, in fact, come. Uh, Enoch lived 300 years of that 600 and, and 969 years of Methuselah's life. That means for, for 300 years, he's teaching his son about righteousness. He's showing his son the way. He's explaining to him what it means to actually walk with God. Uh, Enoch believed that God existed. Therefore, he decided to move towards the one who was the sustainer of life, the one who was the giver of life, the one who was the maker of life, the one who was the master of life. He enjoyed just a day-by-day walking with God. Enjoyed who he was by faith that he had actually pleased God. Because without faith, it's impossible to please him. Enoch sought unbroken uh, relationship. Uh, Enoch sought to, to have the kind of relationship where, where God was just pleased with him on a day by day basis. Think about it, please. Uh, uh, when was the last time? You just enjoy casual conversation with God. Just casual conversation. That's what I mean. For most of us, um, you know, people people will call us, and uh, you know, we've got some we've got some family and friends who, when we see their name, we already like, oh Lord, because we know. They're not calling to ask us how we're doing. They're calling to either ask for us for something or to complain about life. You know, and, and, and 
you know, and, and I'm, I'm breaking protocols there. I see they go into the, into the pulpit, you know, to prepare uh, to minister. But uh, you got to see it. Uh, my need had caught my attention. So it didn't matter what I was doing. I, I was drawn away uh, to who uh, she was. And I had to stop. Thank you, Jesus. I had to stop what I was doing to attend to her need. My point is this, that you want to be the kind of person that if God is working over here and he sees you approaching, that he puts it down to run to you because he sees you running to him, that he is so uh, enamored by who you are that he is, is, is he enjoys you just as much as you enjoy him. And please know, it actually goes both ways. As much as you enjoy God, God enjoys your presence as well. He actually looks forward to talking to you. He can't wait to talk to you. So can you imagine if it's been five weeks and the last time you talked to him was five weeks ago, like, I'm like, well, you know what? I, mean, I feel like I lost my best friend. You were hitting me up. Is that the right word? Did I say it right? <laughs> That's right, right? Okay. Just making sure, you know. Uh, you were hitting me up uh, for five, five weeks straight every day. And now, you know, it's become cold. That's it. Is that right? When the when young heart is gone dry. All right. <laughs> so, <laughs> I, just, you know, I got to confirm on you. <laughs> but then now it's gone dry. I've been done now. You know, I've been used to this happening, and now there's nothing. Uh, I, I imagine that, that, that God, in the same way that we would feel, forward to that, just like he looks forward to Enoch uh, talking with him. Let, let, let's consider Jude. Jude says that Enoch was descended from, from Adam, and that, and, and that uh, Enoch prophesied, saying the Lord is going to come with tens of thousands of saints. Why is he coming? To execute judgment upon all. Now, not just sinners, but he's going to execute judgment upon all. And then, to convince all that are ungodly among them uh, of their ungodly deeds, which they have ungodly committed, and that all their uh, prior speeches where they have ungodly sinners have spoken against God. Uh, Judas is showing us uh, that Enoch, this preacher of righteousness, was trying to convince people and even show that the, the need and, the, and even mention that as through the prophecy that the Lord himself would return. Now, I get it because there's no, there's no uh, uh, prophecy of Enoch in, in, in our Bible. Uh, what Judas is quoting from is from the book of Enoch, uh, chapter 1, uh, verse uh, number 9. It's not in our canonized Bible, uh, but there are records. And so Jude, being a half of Jesus, goes to synagogue and he listens to the scrolls that are there. I don't have time today to tell you how we got the canonized Bible and the authorization that came along with that, but there were men who were involved in bringing those things to pass. I do have uh, a copy of the book of Jude uh, here, and uh, from the book of, uh, from the book of Enoch uh, here. And uh, in, in Enoch, um, he talks about how uh, the Lord will come with, with tens of uh, thousands. He shows how large the house of God is built and how God has uh, uh, hailstones that are like crystals. And, the, and all those hailstones are all over the floor. That God will use those hailstones to, to pelt them uh, uh, at men. And he, and he even calls for uh, the angels to come and, and to write down and to show how ungodly men have become and how they have lusted in, in their own flesh and how they will perish in their flesh because they have chosen to obey God. So God has uh, no choice but to bring judgment upon them. Brothers and sisters, before you think that, that this stuff is actually uh, made up, you got to know that the same thing that he is prophesying is found in Matthew, the, the 24th chapter and the 31st. The same stuff is found in 2 uh, Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse number 10. The same stuff is found in Revelation, the 19th chapter, verses 11 through uh, 16. And it shows, our Bible shows, he's coming to judge us all. Uh, and when he brings uh, that judgment, he's bringing judgment not only to convict. So you and I have to consider how we're going to be judged. We'll either be judged by God to receive reward, or that judgment will bring condemnation. But the decision is yours. You've got to choose. Uh, when I stand for God, and I really judge, because we all will, how will you in turn be judged by the God? Will you learn to walk before him? Because the only way to escape the wrath of God is to learn how to walk with God. Learn how to walk with him. Excuse the joke. That, that Enoch had the kind of walk that God desires. Let me
to take in. What in the world does that mean? How do we conceptualize in, in our head what the idea that he walks with God and then God just takes him? But uh, here's the thought behind that. Um, the, 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 the taking is a carry translation. So let, let, let's just imagine that this is the chasm uh, of death. Okay, The chasm Enoch and God will walk. You will say this as if it's true or not. <laughs> and so Enoch and God will walk. And as they're doing it, they're just walking all the time, just casual conversation, just enjoying each other. Enoch wasn't coming to God asking him to do this or do that. They're just enjoying uh, each other's presence. God saw that Enoch was about to come to the point of death. He saw Enoch was about to come to the chasm of death. So rather than to allow Enoch to fall into death, hallelujah, and then turn around and have the, the right to admit to come to judgment, God decides, let me do this, uh, since you're coming to the point of death, I might as well uh, pick you up and carry you over death into my presence. Now, here's how powerful that is, because uh, the Bible says it's once appointed unto man to die, and after death is the judgment, which would mean this then, that in order for Enoch Glory. to be translated over death and to be carried into God's presence is that God would have to judge him on this side. He would have to be judged in life so that now, while he was walking, God is judging him and knows that he meets my approval in life. He needs not go to, into death to be raised up to be judged. Uh, I see right now he's qualified. Let me carry him past death and bring him right now into my presence. You want the kind of relationship with God that God looks at your walk and he says, I, I like how they walk. <laughs> I'm quite pleased. You know, I, I, they meet my approval. That, that is, in fact, uh, my standard. All of us, the scriptures, the scriptures uh, tells us this, that uh, the Lord himself is going to descend on him with a shout, the voice of the archangel, the throne of God. The dead in Christ shall rise first. But we which are alive and remain shall be caught up, hallelujah, uh, in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be. That word caught up or, or, or be, uh, so shall we ever exist with the Lord. So shall we ever continue uh, with the Lord. And we're told, comfort each other uh, with these words, that, uh, that there is a life that's after this. There is a joy that's after this. And the way to meet God's approval is to walk right before him today. <clears throat> so how in the world, you know, how can I please God? I'm so glad uh, that you asked that question. For those who have notes, this is a very back page and we're finished. Okay. Uh, the first thing you want to do is learn to become a worshiper. Learn to become a worshiper. Think of that means. Worship, brothers and sisters, is, is, is not uh, I love you, I love you, I love you, Lord, today. <laughs> With hands raised, you know, because you care for me. That, that's not worship. Wor worship is not, you know, I'll choose you again. Yeah, that's, yeah. <laughs> worship is not, I'm changing that. Because it's not your the posture of your hands or the song uh, that you're singing. Worship can, ex uh, can be expressed through song. It can be expressed through your hands. It can be expressed through your dance. But worship is uh, an ascribing or an ascribing of worth or value to God. Uh, and you can worship God without a song. Because you value who he is. You can worship God without a dance. Because you value who he is. You know, if worship was about singing, then some those of us who don't sing well, we'd never be worshipers. <laughs> a worship leader is not a, <laughs> we, we confuse song leaders and worship leaders. Okay. Uh, the person who is leading the song may not be the worship leader. They're just leading the song. Go with God. You can lead worship from your seat. And you may never get the microphone to lead the song. But you can lead the worship from your seat. 
No, because you you understand it. If if they don't understand how to ascribe the value to God, let me show you his how it's done. You know, and you're pouring your heart out to him. You're showing how valuable uh, God in fact is, and your heart is I uh, consider. If you say that Jesus is my all and all, and he is all the world to me, it's more than a song. It becomes a lie. It says then that if he is all and all to me, that means if everything is taken away, I'm still fully satisfied. That, that, that my life is not contingent upon what I have. I'm fully satisfied with God. If, he is, if Jesus is the center of your joy, that means your joy is not contingent upon how things are going, that you still have joy even though everything around you is falling apart. If, if, if you say that, I'd rather have Jesus, uh, and you can have this whole world, just give me Jesus, that means if we take your car, your house, your clothes, your food, your job, your money, and you have nothing, you're saying it's all right. Because <laughs> uh, I, uh, I got Jesus, and, and he really is uh, the joy of my life. He is my all uh, and all. Then we can start talking worship because now you're you have decided and you're understanding. God, it's how much I value Him. Uh, so much so that I don't mind being in, in the presence of the people that my hand being raised up. Amen. And I might look ugly, and I and I, and I, and I get tears running down my face, but that's that, that's all in fine because you don't understand how valuable uh, He is. I, I, if I gotta cry, I think about, I'll cry. If my hands have to, if I gotta lay out on the floor, I'll do that too because my my value of Him is more than the value of my clothes.
the salt for a minute. Uh, we sell them to buy a, a pair of running shoes. And um, I, I went to the, you know, to the store to get the, the, the running shoes. And the, the, the lady says to me, um, you know, before I can fit you or, or get the right shoe for you, I need to see how you walk and how you run. I said, well, what's going on? Okay, the shoes no one wants to see how I'm walking and running. And, and she said, I want you to walk down here and then walk back. And she does like, so I start walking, uh, she does like this. And she's just checking out uh, how my feet are hitting the floor. Turn around and walk back. And she just, I mean, she's just staring at my feet, seeing how my feet interact with the floor. She tells me to go on the treadmill. Uh, put up to a place that's comfortable for you. And uh, if you want to see how your feet, uh, how they come down, how they interact on, on the treadmill. Because that's how your feet will interact uh, with the pavement or concrete, wherever you're running. Uh, that's going to, how, how they're going to, how they're going to interact. And I, and I realized what was happening was, uh, while she was squatting, uh, looking at my, my feet, she was trying to notice the impact that my feet have with the floor. And the shoe would be determined. So she's judging my steps. Don't mm. listen. She's judging my steps. When it's talking about walking before God, you've got to consider that God, uh, feet indicate, uh, when feet are on something, it indicates dominion. Uh, whatever you tread upon, God says, I'm going to give it to you. Put your necks on, on the, your feet on the necks of these kings. So the feet indicate when they're placed on something, a place of dominion. So when God is, is when you're walking before God, God is checking out to see how is your dominion in the earth. He wants to know when your feet hit the earth, what kind of power you have. Glory to Jesus. So he's evaluating your steps. He's evaluating your pace. He wants to see the level of impact. Do you know your own impact in the earth? Do you know your level of dominion? In, 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 have you figured that out yet? Do you know how you place your feet in the earth and what kind of impact that actually makes? But it also tells us that we're going to walk after God. Now, that part blesses us God. The first is going to be intimidated because now God's taking up my steps. And I might not be able to keep, you know, walk before him. I may not be uh, uh, doing the right steps. But to walk after God means that God has set the pace. And all i got to do is fall behind what he said. Back to Daniel 1, we had a blizzard in, in Mary, uh, in, the, in the mountains there, in Blue Ridge, the Blue Ridge Mountains, they admit that we didn't have some heavy snow at that, that time. Uh, the snow on that particular uh, weekend, it snowed in close to so, and the snow came up, uh, came up over my, my kneecap up to my thigh. Now, you gotta consider from the floor to my thigh. That's a lot of snow. That's a lot of snow. And uh, so, my dad, council church, uh, <laughs> so that, we didn't council church for much, but that's what I'm saying, the, the council, we'll probably have to like get out, but so, now, uh, I'm a church baby, I love God, and I'm thinking, I gotta go to church today, so I'm looking at the door, at the window, see, is, 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 is dad in the church, because I couldn't find him, and I see these footprints, going into the, I don't see his dad at the church, I'm, I'm going to church, so I, I left out the house. And uh, part of the, the story before, if you've never heard it before, uh, it, it'll bless you. If you've heard it before, just smile like you, you just heard it before. <laughs> uh, so I'm leaving at the house, and I, and I start making, uh, trying to, I'm trying to go through all, all the snow uh, to get there. It's, it's difficult to walk in, in snow that, that deep. And uh, so I'm trying to trek through this, and it, it dawned on me, why am I trying to make a path when my father has already walked the path for me? So I decided what I'm going to do is put my feet in the same place my father's feet have been. Because when I decided to put my feet where he has been, then I'll go where he is. Does that make sense to you? And, and when I do that, then my life is not as hard anymore. Because I'm, I'm striving, trying to get there, uh, making an unnecessary path when the paths aren't even made for me. What are you saying? I'm trying to get you to see that your father has already made a path for you to walk. You just have to choose to walk after him. Amen. Your way would be a lot easier if you would learn to walk after him. So we're told to walk with God. We're told to walk before God. We're told to walk after uh, God. And then he tells us to walk in love. Also tells us to walk by faith, not by sight. And he points to Acts 2. She, when sheep walk, 
uh, sheep, they can live back. They have dim eyesight. Um, so the sheep have to rely on the voice of the shepherd. As sheep are walking, the shepherd has to be making noises so the sheep will be able to hear, which means then that the voice of the shepherd is directional. Please write this down. God's voice is directional. That's important. Please write that down. God's voice is directional. I'll say it again to make sure you get it. God's voice is directional. You want to write that down. That's really important. Put it in your nose. Put it in, in your mind, your heart. God's voice is directional. So the shepherd, of course, has to, has to take a moment to breathe. Even as fast uh, as I talk. And you guys know sometimes when I get excited, uh, I can go for a, 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 a minute. And so, um, even as fast as I talk, I still have to take a moment to, get, to catch my breath. What do you do when God talks? The sheep know, unless the shepherd gave a, a command to stop, that just because the shepherd has talked and they haven't heard his voice uh, for a few seconds, it doesn't mean stop walking. It means keep walking in the light towards the direction you heard the voice the last time. What are you saying? I'm saying this. Don't get frustrated because God hasn't said something in a while. Keep walking in the direction towards the, the, the last time you heard his voice. Uh, I'll give it to you another way. Your GPS uh, will talk to you, and there are moments where it'll tell you to go this direction, and there's a space, and you don't hear anything else. But as soon as you make a wrong turn, that GPS is telling you, you know, uh, as it makes available, right. <laughs> Please turn around. Next level U turn. No, the next level left. And, it, and it keeps talking to you with it. It'll tell you, you're, you're, it's trying to tell you, you're on the wrong path. You're on the wrong path. And it keeps, it's like, it almost gets annoying because it wants you to get back. And as soon as you get back on the right path, <laughs> yeah. here's my point. If God has been badgering you, Maybe you just made a wrong move. And yet get back on the right, the right path. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, you want to keep walking towards where you heard his voice. The last. But the more you keep walking, the, you'll, you'll find yourself, he'll, he'll, he'll talk some more. He always does. Because it's, it's a conversation. You're on the right path. Don't press yourself. You're on the right path. So walk by faith, not by sight. Walk uh, in uh, light, walk in the the spirit, and walk carefully. All those exciting spiritual verses uh, in your notes you can have. Uh, let's pray. Father, thank you so much. You're an amazing God. You never know a heart, a mind, body, or soul. Studying e Enoch's life has been a tremendous blessing. Uh, he's an uncelebrated uh, uh, game changer that uh, we don't all often look at and, and see the value uh, of Enoch, but I thank you. He is uh, a, a, an unsung hero, and now I see how important it is just to walk with you on a daily basis, just to enjoy daily life with you, just to have casual conversation with you. I praise you, God, for that. What an amazing God. And an incredible God really does deserve, deserve an incredible place. So, Father, I praise you for that. That you will help us to learn that, that pace to learn to walk, just like Enoch, uh, to walk with you, to find the joy in walking with you uh, as well. We so appreciate a moment like this. We treasure it, and we're going to hold it deep in our heart so we can live it day by day. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's pray for the Lord's tithe and to bring him our offering.